So, I'm going to look a little bit at New Thought history. And New Thought history, um, it's not all rosy, guys. I don't know. <laughs> it ain't all rosy. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's some bumps and some warts and some fights and some scraps and some knockdown, drag out, kick you in the knees and bite you, fighting going on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just talking about the board meeting. <laughs> But if you think that what happens on the board is different than how it happens out in real life, hello! Because <laughs> we're going to look at some of the founders of New Thought, and guess what? They were doing some kicking and fighting and scratching and punching and saying wild stuff. Good morning, Scott. Great to see you now today. So, and some of you may have studied this, and some of you may have, have learned the philosophies from some of our founders. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to take you through some of the basics today of where we're going to go for the next six months or for, through the end of the year. Because through the end of the year, every Sunday, I'm going to look at, every first Sunday, I'm going to look at one of the, the pillars of New Thought and focus on their teaching. So we're going to have an entire series on New Thought. And, but today is kind of like an overview of all of the, the key people in New Thought. So for some of you this might be new, some of you may not, not have taken any classes, and some of you this is old stuff because you actually taught the classes. So if you are one of those people who taught the classes and I say something wrong from the front of the room, you can either embarrass me and correct me in public. <laughs> Either, either way, I will humbly accept the correction as a gift, as you meant it to be. Because <laughs> we all take the corrections that we don't want. <laughs> you got some feedback for me? <laughs> Bring it all. So, um, our history, the roots of our history, uh, I'm going to start with Emma Curtis Hopkins, because Emma Curtis Hopkins, while she's not considered the founder of New Thought, she really is the mother of New Thought. She really is where the New Thought ideology came together, got crystallized, and got disseminated. So who is Emma Curtis Hopkins? So she's known as the teacher of teachers. She was a student of Mary, Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy founded Christian Science in Boston in the 1800s. Emma was her lieutenant, and Emma was her, her publisher for the magazine. Emma was high in command and living at the, 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 on the compound where other people in the house, where other people were living, with Mary Baker Eddy. And Mary Baker Eddy said really great things about Emma. But at some point, they had a split. And the details of the split, there wasn't anybody standing there to write down the play-by-play. -play. <laughs> so we don't know. Unlike Jesus and Pontius Pilate, we know that somebody was standing there writing everything down, right? Because we have it written down. So somebody must have been standing right there. <laughs> Eighty years later, they remembered all the things that were said, right? <laughs> word for word. Word for word. This literally happened, and it's actually true. <laughs> So, she was the teacher of teachers. What did that mean? She taught every major founder of New Thought. All of the founders of New Thought denominations studied with Emma. Emma called what she was doing Christian Science, as well as Mary Baker Eddy, and she said, I want Christian Science from the Mississippi to the California coast. <laughs> and, and Mary Baker Eddy said, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and Emma said, but I'm going to get, I'm going to. And she said, I'm going to wipe her off the map. <laughs> Emma said this about Mary Baker Eddy, this wonderful, sweet spirit who is a mystic and a teacher of teachers, said, I'm going to wipe her off the map. 
No, but she was actually quoted by one of her students and published. <laughs> so uh, I'm quoting from someone else. I'm quoting from another source. So, so I was not. I was not. <laughs> So, Emma was doing some tours, she was teaching some classes, she's going around the country. This is, remember, before telephone, this was before uh, the automobile, this was before the internet. <laughs> you post a newsletter online and then people just show up. So she was touring the country and she came to San Francisco to teach a, teach a class. And she, there, this is where Annie Ricks Millets met Emma Curtis Hopson. She met her at a, at, a, at a meeting in San Francisco. And at that meeting, uh, Annie took, took, took class, this is 1887, Annie took a class, and she was healed of a migraine and of partial deafness. Wow. And she went immediately back to her home in Alameda and started the Christian Science Home. Like, immediately. Like, oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta do something with this learning that I've got, I received from, from Emma Curtis Hopkins. So she and her sister founded the Christian Science Home, which was the original title of the Home of Truth, which was later changed to the Home of Truth, in that naming war that was happening between the Christian scientists and Emma and her friends. This building was built in 1905 and, and called the Home of Truth, but the, the first center that they had was called the Christian Science Home. It was on Broadway and um, Santa Clara, where the Valley Hotel is now used to be a, a building that looks kind of like the uh, Carson Mansion of North. And I read that uh, Olima, the book. At least Swami Vivekananda used to hang out with them. And he loved. And she's going to get the microphone just about a second. <laughs> if she takes any more of my sermon, okay? <laughs> So in 1890, Annie, Annie goes off to Chicago and she goes to seminary. Who does she go to seminary with? She, seminary with? she goes to seminary with Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. How many of you guys are, come from Unity? Or been to Unity? Been that in Unity or been, been a Unity member? Great. So you guys understand the connection in, in Unity to the Home of Truth is that they were graduated together from the same seminary and I think it was in the same year. So these are classmates of of Annie was Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, and we'll look about at that one a little bit longer. So the Home of Truth. This is this building that 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 uh, artwork. Uh, does anybody know when that artwork was drawn? Because that's not a photograph. That was a. That's on the website though, Randall. Do you know when that was drawn? I do. It, it looks 1940s-ish. So I'm going to guess that it was. It's been that piece of art has been around for a while. And considering that the Home of Truth has been here for 100 years, who knows when it was actually drawn? The original's in the safe deposit box, so maybe, there you go. maybe it says it on there. So in, uh, around that time, Vivekananda, who was a, a Hindu saint, was invited or went to the Chicago Parliament of World Religions. And this is where Annie met him. So the, the, the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago happened in 1893. And for the next four years, Vivekananda toured the U.S. and to in England, and before that, there was not really any Hindu presence in the United States. If there was Hindu presence in the United States, it was scattered. But he really became a force and like a missionary <coughs> to spread Hinduism in this in this country and bring it to this country. So, and he was the founder of the Vedanta Society. How many people have gone to a Vedanta meeting? Okay, there's a cluster of us. Very good. So that's these guys are our cousins. These are our cousins through the connection that Annie and Harriet had with Vivekananda. So what happens when Annie meets Vivekananda, up until that point she really considers herself, fund, found, in her foundation she considered herself Christian based, and the science was a Christian science, and when she meets him she realizes there's a bigger world out there <laughs> than just the JC. <laughs> there's a lot of people in India that like JC, but who their guy is is not JC. So she moved to a more interfaith perspective from this point. So her perspective goes from being a Christian Science to a 
diverse and inclusive philosophy of the spirituality of human beings and we can be diverse in our ide ideology and understand that there's truths in different places from different sources. And whatever those sources are, we can learn and grow and be compassionate and be healers. Because the versions of Christianity in this country um, aren't always first compassionate. And I'm not saying that to slam them, but that's not always their first foot forward, is we're, we're moving into the world with compassion first. So, but that's not only limited to Christianity, but it was the dominant religion here, so, so she says, you know what, we're going to be interfaith, we're going to be inclusive. So that's the little connection between Annie and Vivekananda and the Vedanta Society. So Vedanta is our cousins, they, and you want to think of it that way. And it becomes an author. And she becomes a missionary, so she spent a lot of her time on the road traveling, spreading the word of the home of truth. And there was around 30 homes at one point. At one point, up and down the West Coast, up to Canada, there were place centers that were called, now that might have been in somebody's house, but they were identifying themselves as homes of truth and teachers of the Ricks sisters' interfaith, new thought philosophy. Harriet was based here, she was the minister here, and she was the teacher here. So she, she was based here in Alameda. And then there was the Mastermind magazine, which Annie was the editor and publisher and contributing writer. So that's what was happening here at this very building. So this is the kind of the roots of where we've been from being a New Thought Center. Unity, one of our cousins, it was founded by Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. They, it's known as the Practical School of Christianity. So there's a little bit of difference between the Home of Truth and Unity. In Unity really considers the Bible as one of their main texts. They don't read it literally. They often interpret it metaphysically, but they consider the Bible as one of the main texts. They have a Unity Village in Kansas City, Missouri, which is where they do their seminary and where they do training, and they do publications. They are the most published New Thought um, group. And they have Silent Unity, which is a prayer group, which you can either call in or write in. And I'm betting you could probably email in your prayer request at this point. Mm -hmm. Katie? Do they consider themselves Christian? Yes. Uh, yes. They, they consider themselves mm -hmm. part of the Christian body, yes. Mm -hmm. But they also consider themselves New Thought. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll say, They'll, if you ask them, they might say this. Yes, but. <laughs> they're the yes, but Christians. <laughs> and they're the largest New Thought denomination. They have over 300 centers worldwide. There were close ties in the beginning with uh, the Home of Truth and Unity. And Annie was a writer for their materials. And Jasmine will tell you what she's come across. She can actually find stuff that's in Unity's literature that she said, that sounds like he and he's writing. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the historical um, knowledge of Annie's contribution to Unity was not a focus of, me. they didn't maintain it well, and I, can't, I don't know if it was volitional or if it was accidental, but Annie has basically been disappeared from Unity. So you won't find Annie's name credited for the contributions that she made. And that just might be another one of those kicking and scratching and fighting and fighting kind of situations. So in 1911, she splits formally from the Fillmore's and the Home of Truth is, is no longer um, in partnership with, with Unity. So our pioneers in New Thought include the Fillmore's in the top left corner, Emma Curtis Hopkins, who's in the center of the top, and Mary Baker Eddy. And Mary Baker Eddy, I'm going to include in this, even though she, Christian science isn't considered new thought, they don't call themselves, if you talk to a Christian scientist, they don't call themselves a new thought person. Um, and Annie on the left, on the bottom, and Harriet on the right, and Ernest Holmes. 
And Ernest Holmes uh, was the founder of what was called Religious Science, which has changed its name to Centers for Spiritual Living. And they changed their name for many reasons, but one of the, some, some of the reasons were they wanted to distance themselves from Christian science, they wanted to distance themselves from Scientology. <clears throat> but if we look at where the splits happened in our history in New Thought, we had a split between Emma and Mary that was not a particularly nice split. And that wipe you off the map. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what you say when you're being compassionate and gentle with someone, is it? <laughs> there was a split between uh, Unity and Annie. Don't know the details of it. If somebody knows the details of it, please enlighten me so I can include it in future talks. There was a split within Unity itself. So unity split into two, two and three different organizations. You have people that are unity, that are independent unity. Then there's the Association of Unity. And then there's uh, Unity School of Practical Christianity, which is separate from the Association of the Unity Churches. And they are currently going through a unification process. They are going through, yeah, they're going through a reconciliation, which is a uh, a wonderful thing, and they've actually been talking to, I'll, I'll say that for a second, I'll come back to you in a second, Ernest Holmes, in the, the 50s and 60s, his, his denomination st started to disagree about how they were going to train ministers, and over that decision, they split into two organizations, International and United. So they have two different organizations, and one says you got to go to seminary, and one says no, we'll We'll train him up here. We're going to homeschool him. <laughs> Ernest Holmes was his name. We're going to homeschool our ministers. There were other factors, but the simple version of they disagreed on how they were going to train their, their ministers, and they split. And we are in the final days of seeing the organization become unified. Katie's put her hands up. Yes, yes. Katie, Katie used to be the Northern California uh, youth representative of... Uh, the Centers for Spiritual Living. Her job was to coordinate youth services, uh, youth youth coordinated events here in Northern California. So she's she was on staff for the Centers for Spiritual Living, and she's my friend, and she sings with me. So we see that split being healed, but it didn't get healed in Ernest's lifetime. It got healed 60, 60, 60 years later. Where did Ernest fall? Sorry. If Ernest was alive during the split, where did he fall? He he, he, he he was more on the teaching side, teaching, uh, uh, having a seminary. Yeah. He didn't even want a church. Right? At first he didn't want a church, but once, once they established a church, he wanted to see that the, the training was consistent and not just done in the, in the individual churches. Um, those are not the only reasons why it's split, but I'm not to be on the scope of this, this conversation. But the point I'm making about this is that things happen that have upsetting and difficult circumstances around them. And we have a choice about how we're going to behave in those, in those moments. Are we going to let the things split us apart? Or are we going to bring ourselves together in peace and in love and say, we can work this out? And so, even our leaders sometimes can't do that and didn't do that. Um, but we do see that the, well, first of all, like with religious science, <clears throat> Centers for Spiritual Living, nobody was left who remembered why we split up in the first place. <laughs> they were all gone. Why did we break up? I don't know. Why did we break up? <laughs> that was then, back then. So it's been a wonderful thing. And as being trained in religious science, being a religious science practitioner, for me, watching that healing happening has been a, a total blessing. Watching the two organizations come together and say, you know what? It's like finding our long-lost cousins or our long-lost siblings. And we're saying, wow. Welcome home. So, the point I want to make about that is that splits and rifts, they can drive us apart, but we don't need to let them. We don't have to have our differences of opinions drive us apart. We can come together in love and compassion and work through our difficulties. It doesn't always work. But 
that's the place I'm saying we should stand, and that's the place that I'm saying that we should try. We should try to work things out. And I know that there's been some tension in the home of truth. And, and one of the things that I know about the home of truth is you guys are fiercely independent. <laughs> and you kind of like it that way. But some of that fierce independence kind of gets in the way of looking beyond the circumstances that you're dealing with today and looking beyond how are we going to live out into the future? How are we going to grow? How are we going to thrive? How are we going to thrive if we're not training people in our theology to become ministers? Where are we going to find leadership if we're not doing the training ourselves? Well, you got to reach out to your cousins. You got to say, hey, we're, we're a new thought center and what we need here is new thought leadership. And whether that's from the Vedanta Society or from Unity or from Religious Science, those are the places that are training people in leadership and you kind of have to say, okay, we've, we've, we've tried other leaders from different training, but our roots are in new thought. So this is my kind of challenge to you and my charge to you is remembering your, your roots in new thought and staying true to your roots in new thought. And when you've got tension, when you've got trouble, when you've got difficulty within the board, within the center, where you have to take it is into, into, into prayer. Mm -hmm. Trying to work it out through personalities and pushing it through isn't going to work. The place to, the, the place to take that is into prayer. And from that place, from that centered place, you can work anything out. Because you're doing it with compassion and love. Most of this lecture has been very heady, very, you know, academic. But now I want to take you into an experiential moment of this. The experience is, we claim every Sunday when we gather that we stand for the principles of unconditional love, compassion, peace, trust, and joy. We claim that every time we get together. We read that in our mission statement. I've heard in these walls, I've heard people say things that don't come from that place. I've heard the words, when I mentioned Ernest Holmes, I've heard the words in this, in this very building, oh, so you're quoting from the enemy. <laughs> It doesn't matter who said it, but the notion of the home of truth as an independent new thought center being fiercely independent, we also have to say who our cousins are, who our family is, and say we greet them with love, compassion, trust, joy, peace. peace. So. I've heard people say things about the congregation itself. I've heard, we're so dysfunctional. <laughs> Tell me you haven't thought it. <laughs> okay? That's not standing in the principles of unconditional love, compassion, peace, trust, and joy. We're not standing there when we say things that disparage our community. Anything less than holding it in the light of God is the effect of, it's effectively a curse. Anything less than holding the home of truth and its membership in the light and presence of God is basically cursing the home of truth. And if you said something that was negative or disparaging, forgive yourself. And don't do it. Don't say bad. <laughs> Don't say bad things about the center. Lift the center up. Don't say bad things about people in the center. Lift them up. Hold them in compassion. Hold them in trust. Hold them in peace. Hold them in love. Hold them in joy. And if you can't do it in your mind, make sure you do it with your mouth. Don't open your mouth. And then wait. Negative thinking, stinking thinking, will pass like gas. <laughs> Just wait a little while and it'll go away. <laughs> yeah, open a window.
there just an open window. <laughs> so if you've said something negative about yourself, if you've said something negative about your community, if you've said something negative about another member in this community, if you've said something negative about any of the brothers and sisters in any of the New Thought denominations, if you've said something negative about any other religious denomination, that only creates a restriction in your consciousness and it doesn't allow you to grow. So the steps are forgive yourself and move on. And then bring to that other member, bring to the board, bring to the center, bring to, the, to the, your relationship with yourself unconditional love, compassion, peace, trust, and joy. Bring that. Be vigilant about what you say about your brothers and sisters. And always lift them up. Good song. It kind of <coughs> emphasizes this thought. I'd like to use this as an anchor to our our time together this morning.